Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Pat Petrillo to talk about all kinds of cool things. Pat, welcome to the podcast. Bart, thanks for having me. I'm glad we got a chance to connect and make this happen. Thank yes. you. Yes. First off, I just want to say it's it's been out for a little bit, but a major, huge congratulations for getting on the cover of Modern Drummer, February 2023. Thank I mean, you, man. Unbelievable. Well, yeah. you know, it's um, what turned out to be, you know, an interview uh, initially turned out to be an, a bigger interview. And then we just kept talking as a bigger interview. And then before you know it, it's like, you know, I, I, you know, they let me know, hey, man, you know, this is turned out to be pretty cool and, and we're going to make it a cover. And it was like, wow. wow. Okay. I thank, uh, you know, all the guys over there and uh, for doing it and David Frangioni and, um, um, Mark for interviewing me and and uh, Lloyd Bishop the, who took great photos and uh, just great to just talk about you know a little bit about my drum history and yeah. you know, my career and, and stuff and the, and the new record and stuff like that so thank you very much and thanks to Modern Drummer absolutely uh, which the new album we'll talk about is Pat Petrillo Big Rhythm Band the Power Station Sessions but before we do that can I ask you like some questions about what it's like to get that feature on the cover. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Griffith has been on the podcast before. Amazing writer, amazing, incredible brain for drumming and music, uh, yeah. which which I found out pretty quickly. David has as well. And those are great guys. But um, like, I've always been curious about getting the photo taken. What was that like? Do they come uh, well, to you? It's curious. Um, like I said, Lloyd Bishop, who does uh, a lot of the photos uh, on the Seth for the Seth Meyers show and, and, and various other things. He's just a great photographer, very dramatic, very New Yorkish. You know, um, I had him do some photos before one of our gigs at the Cutting Room um, for various you know promotional things and 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 for the article itself. As I knew it was going to be, I was being interviewed for for. Uh, you know, for the magazine, and they needed some good pictures. So he took great shots, and uh, you know, we we made sure we got some really nice front ones. You know, just in case, you never know. And uh, as it turned out, you know, he got a really really great uh, front shot for that. And and you know, um, it features the drums, which is Ludwig, of course, and the cymbals, yep. Zildjian, and it's just. Um, I think uh, it's very it's it's a little surreal, you know. I I put a video on my Instagram, which is Pat P Drummer, by the way, but uh, <laughs> it just came in the mail, you know. And I just looked at it, and there it is, you know. The pull yourself out of the mailbox is <laughs> a little bit surreal. <laughs> yeah. But as you know, they've been through tough times with things and COVID, and and there's a new regime now, and it's kind of make up for the old things and. And, you know, they're doing a bi-monthly issue now. So Chris Johnson is on the other side in the January, and mine is on February. So they'll be doing yep. bi-monthly, you know, print. And it's, at least they're in business, and they're doing the best they can. So, But yep. I thank them so much for that. Absolutely. Very, very cool. I, I always like the style of the covers of of Modern Drummer. There's always kind of a, a certain they, – they have, like, a, a feel to them. Yours is very, like – has the blue background your leather jacket is very cool the finish of the drums is just that's beautiful straight out of 1975 right there bro that that jacket that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> i love it so that that's super cool and mm -hmm. and and i you yourself are a very accomplished musician but to have uh made it on the cover of modern drummer as a uh someone who has really kind of led their own career as a drummer clinician educator kind of a win for drummers in general because it's great when when a a drummer's on the cover of modern drummer who's in a big band let's say you are uh like the late great taylor hawkins or something sure. where you're a phenomenal drummer but yeah, you are on the cover bands. you're in a huge band you yourself are in very successful bands but you're a drummer's drummer you know i mean well, that leads us into why don't you tell us about maybe your background and yeah. your uh you know what got you to that point of being on the cover yeah well, I mean, it is it is a journey, and and um, I've just uh, I've always uh, I just I sort of I think there are s people who kind of gravitate towards the instrument, and I was just I don't know gravitated towards the instrument out of at an early age. I have two uh, like much older brothers, and one of them has, has uh, played in a like in a garage band per se, and and um, I used to just kind of always go and hang out at their practices, and once I got old enough. You know, I started uh, listening to to records and um, 
and and I just it just came to me naturally. You know, I think some people it's it's you know some people have, are, are just a fit, have an affinity for it, coordination wise or whatever. But I think listening to music was a big thing for me. I mean, um, I listened to a lot of music before I even had a drum set. You know, and I mean for me the the Beatles were pretty much over <laughs> by the time I got to start playing. But yeah. you know, I went yeah. back to the old records and really though that was my 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 um my i guess my home base cuz my brother sure. listened to them a lot and then i you know but i say my wheelhouse was then you know went from them to like we're talking you know i was a you know i was a young kid in you know in the mid 70s and and just listening to you know fm radio and listening to you know whether it's uh I, from a rock standpoint, I, I loved like Yes, and I loved like more progressive, quote unquote, stuff then. But then like James Brown and and yeah. Marvin Gaye and the Motown stuff as well, and and listening to to R and B and funk and soul, as well as being able to turn the dial and then listening to to groups like Aerosmith and you know stuff like that. So grew up listening to a variety of of, of music, you know, um, yeah, at an early age, and then I got involved in drum corps. Uh, lo my local drum corps, like I said, I had older brothers, so I kind of grew up as like an only child in my house. <laughs> and so my mom wanted to get me involved. She saw I had a little bit of a gift, so I got involved in a local drum corps, which is where I learned my, my rudiments and my chops, my hand stuff, and then progressed through the drum corps thing. But drum set was always, you know, by that time I had my first, I think, you know, drum set, an old Ludwig kit, which I wish I still had, but I don't. But, yeah. um, and, and always would play along to records and, and the radio. You know, my dad had a nice stereo system downstairs. So I just would play along to things and, and learn on my own. I never really had a teacher uh, on drum set. My teachers were Claude Stubblefield and Ringo and Jabbo and, sure. and, 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 you know, Earl Palmer, which I didn't know at the time, but all those great drummers, those were my teachers. So I had my yeah. rudimental thing. And then I also had like what I did on drum set, you know, so. Yeah. Um, I can definitely hear that in your in your playing of absorbing all those styles and uh, but you clearly have the foundation. I feel like feel like root, which I didn't go that route. I went more of the like drum set lessons and playing in bands. You get yeah. that. You get that. It's all good. No matter where you we all end up where we're supposed to end up. Mm. But I, I definitely think you you absorbing that uh, those great drummers. Uh, it was there's no, it, nothing it was, beats that. Yeah. Thank you, man. I mean, that's that's huge for me. I mean, that's. You know, you try to, I and mean, when you're in that early stage, you know, when you're a kid, you're emulating sort of, you know, you're in that copy mode. and But that's how you learn, you know, and you, it, it just goes in your ears. And I would just sit there and drop the needle, man, and just listening to the records and growing up, you know, here in Jersey, listening to Parliament Funkadelic and, yeah. getting, all, and getting the Funkadelic records and the Parliament records. Sure. And then getting, um, you know, I guess getting turned on to, I think, like I made a leap when I got turned on to to um, Chick Corea, uh, the Return to Forever bands, and you know my other friends that were listening to a variety variety of music, and you know and listening to Steve Gadd and 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 him, you know, with later with Chick and um, and then playing with Al Jarreau and all those records, he, you know, all that. When I heard his his playing, it it, it spoke to me because. I did hear the stuff that I was learning in drum corps. I, I heard some rolls. I heard some some fills that I didn't hear the other cats playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that yeah. was like I could relate to that. I heard that was like a six stroke roll. Okay. And that and all that started to come together with his great groove. So that all sort of yeah. blended for me. You know. So my Ringo, Clyde, Jabbo, Gad <laughs> sort of tree. You know. Yeah is my history in terms of drumming. We have so many different cool little things we can talk about, but you've zeroed in a lot on, let's say Ringo with your, your how it was played series that you're doing on your social media, which on Instagram, yeah, I yeah. think is just awesome because well, on Instagram, I'm, I'm a diehard Beatles fan and I love playing along to like, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I got a Sirius XM trial with a car and then I was like, mm -hmm. I love this so much. I listened to the Beatles channel all the time. Sure. I, I, I was like, I'll sign I was up. On this there. is great. That's awesome. What what was that like? That was cool. Just to call in, discuss the record a little bit. But but yeah, that's a great channel. Love it. Cool. Ringo is one of those people that that it's it's like Lars Ulrich, where people are like, he's not good. I don't like him, which is just yeah, a joke to me that. because yeah. Ringo's 
phenomenal. Watching you play, you know, because you don't get these videos of of Ringo behind the kit breaking yeah. things down in the old days. Mm -hmm. Watching you play him is just incredible, and and it's it adds more complexity than I originally thought. Because yeah. you know, I kind of play along it, to him, yeah. and I go, yeah, that's a, that's. Yeah, when you see it, and I'm like, I'm pretty close, but there's there's just such an interesting style. I know there's the whole he's actually left-handed and he's playing right-handed, but w what has that been like to really break those down and learn them? Well, that's that was the impetus. What you said was exactly it. That was the impetus of it. Like, there's no, like, and listen, Ringo did that one video. People keep referencing that he played. You know, he he was on some show or something. He was demoing come together and he started on the floor tom and came and he said first of all he was playing on a three yeah. piece he wasn't playing on a four piece you know that's obviously not what he played on the record so you know if he doesn't sure. remember what he played that that's okay you know and and but the records are his legacy the records are what he played so i i says well i'm going to do a series called how it was played and we'll start with ringo but i'm also doing clyde jabbo earl palmer all these great drummers that we don't We've heard these grooves, but we haven't seen them. And I've seen guys do videos of Ringo. Obviously, there's hundreds of them out there. But the whole left-hand lead yeah. thing is, is, is a little bit deceiving because he doesn't start to fill with the left hand. And a lot of them, it'll be a pickup. He actually starts with the right hand. It's very simple. He plays every backbeat, any mm -hmm. downbeat with his left hand, and any 16th pickup you hear is going to be with his right hand. It's that simple. So if you hear him go, da da doom, yep. da da doom, it's going to be a right hand pickup 16th into a left hand. So a lot of the sticking, if you know that going in, a lot of the sticking is, is self-explanatory. And then you just listen to the orchestration and you hear what it is. And then, but the difficult thing is the feel because he's so great, you know, you know, and his influences, you know, go back to the great, you know, whether it's Topsy or it's, uh, you know, Earl Palmer's or any of this, his influences over the years that he listened to, you could hear with great American drummers had that little swing and he has that lilt. And that only comes really from listening and the experience of listening to him play. So he's sort of embedded in my DNA. So I try to do the best I can. There's only one Ringo. Yeah. But I felt as if if people could really see how he played it with the right sticking and the right phrasing on the right drums. Like I have my 66 is right here. I kind of swap out the, the vintage yeah. with my new Ludwigs. But um, – and, and that's how it was played. That's how we did it. If you listen, you know, as an educator, too, as well as a drummer, you know, that's the sticking. That's what he used. Those are the drums. That's knowing him. That's the only way he could possibly play that. So I thought it would be a great idea sure. to show Ringo if he was to play his parts for you on a video and remember what they were. And, and and what are they? And do it the right way, you know, and from a drummer's perspective. And no high tech. I just use my iPhone, man, because I have a, I have a great um, Automute system here, as you can see on my walls. Uh, shout out to Mitch at Automute. Thank yep. you very much. Um, but Beautiful. it sounds great right to my iPhone. So I basically play the track through my, my, my studio speakers. You can hear it in the background. But I wanted to focus on the drum parts, you know, and no high tech stuff. And... You know, there there it is, and um, I feel as it's important that we're you know you highlight not just Ringo but Earl and Clyde and Jabo and all the great drummers and, and of course uh, you know Zig Monalist Gad and because we're all standing on their shoulders and and that's my history like my history is their yeah. drumming you know and and I think it's important to highlight For them. Sure. so um, it's a fun series I'll keep doing them yeah. and. I'm getting requests, you know. So, and it was one of my my first videos well, that's, to get over yeah, 250,000 awesome. views. I was like, "Whoa, okay, great." So now I, I got to figure out what yes. else I'm going to. It's a couple more I'm going to do, I think. Well, that's the sign. I mean, to speak a little to the 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 what I do and what you're doing, the side of it of the production and the social media and the the sharing. People like it. Keep doing it. If if uh, if if it's making you happy, keep doing it. But also, one thing, just like you know, because people might be interested in this, that I've I've learned of from doing a lot of YouTube and things is, if you set yourself up to be like, all right, I'm gonna have 13 drum mics, I'm gonna have a camera running, like a you know video camera, I'm gonna do this. You will be setting yourself up in many cases, setting yourself yeah. up for failure because it's too hard to reproduce. You're smart to do your iPhone. It sounds great. 
you, yeah, you I gotta mean, I, have a low barrier to just turn it on and do it, and then that's that's how yeah, you are quick, successful. You know, like I have the camera set up. I have I have great uh, Earthworks mics thanks to yeah. Earthworks. I have cameras in the front, camera in the top side. I have a great system here that, um, that I run. Um, so using the Black Magic uh, switcher. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if I'm going to do something with my you know with my drums and mic'd and really with the good cameras, but I just wanted something quick. That Sounds I think great. people can relate to this right through the iPhone. So thanks for that, you know, guys. It's on Pat P Drummer on Instagram, so check it out. Yeah, yep. and it's just it's my homage to Ring, and um, he's just uh, you know, it's a, underrated if you want to call it. But it's just that you don't get to see what his real sticking is, and you don't get to see how it was played. There's not a whole lot of video because a lot of their videos, if you see, he's miming, and you're not going to see him play any of the newer stuff. Like no. from Revolver on down, you're never you're never going to really see any video of him playing that because they yeah. never played that stuff. You know, a lot of that stuff live, not sure. for very long. No, you know. So yeah, no, it's incredible. Thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely, and there's there's if people are interested in more about Ringo, there's plenty of Ringo episodes with uh, Gary Astridge just done a bunch who I was fortunate to just see over the weekend, great and uh, Gary's a great guy and 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 had the big you know peace sign hand that we got pictures in front of. This week's episode is brought to you by my friend, Mr. Jeff Burke and the Rogers Drums USA Facebook group. Jeff has built an unbelievable community around the love of vintage Rogers drums. I can tell you from many firsthand experiences with Jeff that he is the real deal and is extremely authentic and just a super nice guy. And that comes through across all of the Rogers Drums USA group. The group is all about friendship and mixing younger generations and older generations of Rogers enthusiasts together to get everyone in the same spot. Jeff is a proud Rogers collector with an enormous collection, and he's also working as a consultant for the new Rogers Drums and is doing a great job with that. Rogers Drums USA is all about spreading the message of Rogers legends Joe Thompson and Ben Strauss and keeping the history of Rogers alive. So find them on Facebook at Rogers Drums USA. Just type that in and you'll find it. And be sure to join Jeff on the enormous, big, comfy couch that is always at the drum shows when Rogers uh, USA is there. And you can sit down, hang out with Jeff, take a load off. I certainly did recently at the Chicago show and had an absolute blast hanging out at their booth and getting to relax for a little bit. So uh, be sure to find them at the, the drum shows and say hello and tell them you heard them, uh, heard this ad on drum history and just say hi to Jeff. So thank you to Jeff and the Rogers Drums USA group for sponsoring this episode. Pat, let's go ahead and talk about your album a little bit, which is incredible. But I also want to segue then into this, this is drum history. So let's talk a little bit about some history yeah. stuff as we go. Um, so like I mentioned, it is the Pat Petrillo Big Rhythm Band. The album is the Power Station Sessions. I listened to it um, about a month ago when we were we've been trying to schedule this for a while. And then I listened to it yeah, again yeah, yeah. this morning mm -hmm. and I just love it. Tell us about the album. What was it like with the recording process? And you've got some, first off, tell us everyone who's on it with you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, um, the impetus was just to be on, you know, to get some, some great players. Um, I have great players in my band, but I wanted to get, um, I think the, the, in my band, the chair that rotates the most is guitar. So I wanted to get, um, some groove, some great groove players as well as, you know, I've worked with Oz Noy before, so I wanted to get Oz on the record. But I, you know, now Rogers was on my my radar when I wrote Forty Eighth Street. I mean, mm -hmm. that to me is an homage to the to what New York used to be, uh, yeah. and um, with Forty Eighth Street was the place where everything was really happening: music stores, Manny's studios, and to me, like. It's Power Station, the Power Station studio, recording studio, synonymous with so many great artists. But for me growing up, like Chic and now Rogers was huge. So when I'm in like seventh grade or whatever it is, you know, sixth, seventh grade and, and you know, and, and Chic comes out, I'm like, that was the record. You know, it, it, everybody was really into Chic and now Rogers. Yeah. So I, um, I was really intent on trying to get him to you know to get on the record and and he's such a sweetheart of a guy and um my buddy steve jankowski who played horns and did some arrangements on the record is in sheiks is in his band so he asked nile and and we just connected and it was great because you know i sent him the track and he uh you know he just laid it down 
in his in his own inimitable style and mm, got totally. a chance to stretch out a little bit but all of those great records were cut and those great rhythm sections of the late great tony thompson big influence you know on me and bernard edwards and that whole thing screamed new york funk yeah you know so that is the scene of <laughs> the power station of 48th street For plus sure. what he produced and what he did with with so many great artists you know from madonna and bowie um, so anyway, so yeah. I want it now and Osnoy and then another great New York guitarist, uh, Felicia Collins is on it. Um, and she's a real versatile, um, guitarist and she played on that track, Asbury Days, D-A-Z-E, which, awesome. yep. uh, which I wrote just about, you know, Asbury Park, man, which is, you know, about a half an hour from me. And I used to love going down there when I was younger and I go down there now for my little r and R. I just want to get away and catch the vibe of the boardwalk, man. And, yeah. and that. That New Jersey kind of horn, power horn band, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes kind of vibe, you know, that was a whole nother thing that I would listen to growing up as well. So that was always kind of buzzing around here, you know, so I wanted to try to capture that. So some good guests on the record um, and also an homage. Um, in some ways, I, I cut a version of Black Cow. Um, with, with Steely Dan and um, yep. Oz is on that one. And that's getting released to radio this week, actually. Oh, cool. Um, Congrats. And we kind of, thank you, man. Just a, a, a updated, little updated version, a little faster, a little bit more, you know, you put a little bit more swing on it. But, you know, um, I'm a I'm a big fan of the great grooves and, you know, and, and groove history and great yeah. tracks and great songs. So another cover I did was Billy Joel's Big Man on Mulberry Street. And a great story, um, you know, Liberty DeVito, shout out to Lib. He's a, just a good friend and it's a beautiful person. And when, when I said, man, I, I'm going to do a cover, uh, your groove for Big Man on Mulberry Street is just friggin' killing. So um, it's a great feel with that upbeat hi-hat. Boom. Yep. Right. So I kind of copped that and then also turned it into a halftime thing. Um, but he says, interesting story about that is we cut that at the power station. Oh, cool. And I was like, that I didn't know. And he said, what room are you in? I said, I'm in room C. He goes, we cut it in room C. <laughs> wow. So now I'm like really freaking out. He goes, it was meant to be. I said, I had no idea. He goes, yeah, man, we cut it. We cut it in, in, at sea. And um, he goes, I remember actually being up on a riser in there. He's telling me the whole story of how they cut it. And that made it even more flavorful for me to be yeah. there where he cut it, you know. And yeah. then my engineer on the session was Roy Hendrickson. And Roy was an assistant engineer on that session. <laughs> Or Billy Joel man. when he was younger. Wow. So this it's whole like, thing has come full circle, man. Yeah, it was crazy, really crazy. So that's incredible. Uh, so it's a real, it's a real fun, diverse record. Of you know, it's not a drummy record, you know. Although there is no, a solo on it. Yeah, on running. You know, is that I what the solos it, on? On running, yeah, the Earth Wind and Fire yes. cover. Yes. So I did an arrangement of that, and and um, there's a part in running on the original where it breaks down to like nothing so i figured that would be a good spot to put a drum solo the one and yep. only sort of solo that's in there actually that's not true we i did a little solo on pocky way as well but very well and that's played, a one though, take tasteful oh thank you man it's one take drum solo i did the only take uh did not wow. do any punch-ins um the video i believe is on the modern drummer website uh it's on youtube as well uh so i just did you know, the band was kind of shocked because we were cutting it. And I said, I'll probably punch in the solo. Just, you know, keep your eyes open. I just didn't. I kept playing and did the solo, counted the band back in, and off we went. So uh, yeah. it it was a it was fun project. And I'm glad, you know, drummers will dig it because it's it's some fun grooves and good music. And it's and it's pretty diverse record as well. So and it's on my I have vinyl on my site. Oh, cool. That's good so. to know. So you can get it there at, at patpdrummer.com. And there's nothing wrong with yeah. like, I, I, of course I like them, like drummer, drum albums. But this is like, mm. I mean, even as a drummer, there's times where you don't on a daily basis want to put those on just because maybe you want some more like musical 
music, if that makes yeah. sense. This is very yeah, musical. which implies sometimes drum records can yeah, drum records sort of beat you over the head. You know? A little, but sometimes so, you're in the perfect mood for it and you want to hear those. But but uh, this is a very it's like a. I listen to it and I go, wow, that's a phenomenal drummer. But I would also like put it on and my wife would go, oh, this is good music where she's not a drummer. You know, oh, thank you, man. Everyone can check it out. I'll put the link in the description. But Pat, originally we talked about because you have a background in teaching and all this stuff. Um, I would be interested in. The idea came up because this is the drum history podcast to kind of address a little bit about the differences of R&B and funk and kind of the nuances mm -hmm. between them. So maybe for a little bit of the like educational history part of the show, because that's definitely a part of this podcast. Wow. OK, cool. Can can do. <laughs> so growing up sort of, you know, listening to that stuff. But, you know, I I taught. Um, when I used to teach at um, the old Drummers Collective um, in New York City, I did teach an uh, R&B and funk class. And it's like there's a difference between rhythm and blues, which was rock and roll, really, mm -hmm. and funk. Okay? So even though James Brown may have had a song called, you know, Make It Funky, or he'd say – he'd use the term funky – James Brown was not the godfather of funk. James Brown was the godfather of soul. Yeah. So rhythm and blues and soul is James Brown uh, more, uh, more up top, let's say. Snare ghost notes, interplay, right? The Clyde Stubblefield, Jabbo Starks, that kind of R&B style. Finger style bass, bass lines, boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom, boom, R&B. Sure. You know? Uh, you would not consider that funk. To me, and I think to a lot of people, funk started in 1970, pretty much. The genre of funk started with Larry Graham, Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself, Sly and the Family Stone. Yeah, yeah. The minute he went, boodle bit, boop, bit, boop, boodle bit, boop, and he started slapping and yeah. popping the bass, hello. That's, yes. That was some different kind of stuff, right? You would not call that an R&B song by any means. That's funk. No. Yes. Uh, to me, that's where the genre started. Um, and that meant the drums got a little simpler on top and things started getting heavier on the bottom. R&B is a little more on top, syncopated, ghost notey. Funk is a little more on the bottom. Right? A little bottom heavy. Yeah. So that's where the kick drum and the bass start to lock and pop together. You know? So you created yeah. that foundation. A lot more space. Even with Tower Power, I, I would, I, you know, they're a funk band. Absolutely. You would call them a funk band. But to me, they started in more of an R&B setting with Rocco's finger style and David's, you know, beautiful grooves that he crafted. They're, you know, more of a rhythm and blues R&B horn band. And then things got a little different, maybe with Drop It In The Slot for them. That became more of a funk record. But that's sure. that, to me, is a, is a delineation line right there, 1970. Yeah. And I would say, too, that just co coming from, like, being in Cincinnati, Bootsy Collins, you, you, you know, P-Funk, Funky, like, sure. there's almost, to me, just throwing this out there, like, in the, in the whole, like, vibe – there's a little bit more of, in a very good way, like a weirdness to funk. There's like a, there's like a, 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 a style. And yeah, I, I unfortunately, space, space and stuff. Yeah. exactly. And I, I've, I, the first day of interning at my, what later became a job, I got to record Bootsy and he came in and man, that guy is not pretending on camera. He is, he bre lives and breathes. That's who, he that, is. <laughs> that's who he is. But, but with those guys and you get, that's like the funkadelic side and the, and just that, large over the top thing yeah. but yeah that that has a vibe for sure yeah absolutely and you know and them them being from jersey you know that that history of funkadelic was you know george clinton being from you know north uh plainfield new jersey was about a half an hour from here started as a 50s doo-wop group the parliaments mm. who then you know he put out a bunch of records apparently as the as the parliaments and then funkadelic started in the psychedelic 60s apparently that's when those records came out because by the time i got them 
they had been out for a little bit in the late 60s, mm. early 70s. And I looked yeah. at them like, well, these are, this is wacky. But songs like Cosmic <laughs> Slop, if you yep. listen to early Funkadelic, you're going to hear Red Hot Chili Peppers. Totally. Basically. I mean, yeah. if you listen to Chili, if you like the Chili Peppers, you'll love early Funkadelic. So that's what, yep. Funkadelic was, was, was rock with a funk edge to it. It came yeah. out in, in the early 70s, I guess, 70, 71, late 60s maybe, but 70, 71, 72. So f- then, you know, with George, with his cycle of, of you know, creativity and always moving and changing lanes, created the parliaments again, but called it parliament. And parliament became, they had their own records. So Funkadelic was on Westwood and parliament was on CBS, I think, you yeah. want to say? Not sure. I think so. But they were the more, they became pop. Okay. So, you know, um, with their record, uh, Give Up the Funk, crossed over, that was funk, right? They're, so they're a funk personified. So that's, sure. so Parliament kind of broke that that mold, you know, and, and saying you can't play, you know, funk on the radio because they kind of broke through that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so, there is a difference between R&B and funk to me. Like, like a producer yeah. asked me to play an R&B groove. I'm not going to play. be playing a lot of boom, gat, go, 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 gat, go, go, gat, go, 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 gat, go, go. I'm not going to be playing like a, a heavy bass, heavy kick drum, syncopated. I'll be playing a little bit more. More Clyde. Be playing a little bit more on top, a little more R&B. Yeah. If I'm going to play funk, I'm going to be pocket and and I'll be playing a little bit more syncopated bass drum. So that's to me and and in my ears and and knowing a little bit about the history of of the musics that that that's the, the delineation. Then a lot of great funk bands, you know. You had uh the Barkays, uh Brass Construction from um I think they're from Queens or Brooklyn. Mm. Uh, this great funk horn bands and then my favorite Earth, Earth, Wind & Fire, you know? Yeah. Which really sounded like early Earth, Wind & Fire. If you listen to Faces, that's like a fusion record. <laughs> yeah. You, you'd almost, you, if you didn't know any better, you'd think that was like Herbie Hancock or something. Well, they're so talented. So like that, they're so, and there's so many members that it's like, it, 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 and they're such a well-orchestrated uh, band. It's It's obvious that they're, they're they're so on top of it that it some bands just stick out in that in that way of just being so talented yeah and and you know when you add some of their songwriting and then you got the david foster songwriting and 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 the how we orchestrated their backgrounds and horn parts and harmonies incredible so they're one of my all-time faves as well so i grew up listening to like all of that stuff so you know i'm you know when i when i play i think i think we all are sort of an, an amalgam amalgamated mix of so many of all our influences and then eventually it does come out like you because it's your physicalness it's your body it's it's what you hear it's how you play that's going to come out you know and it's going to come out only if you listen to the music you have to visit it musically you know And and i say this to people in clinics and too is you can't come from somewhere unless you've been there and I don't mean sure. go visit it physically. I mean visit it musically. So you can't come yeah. from a funk sensibility or an R&B or a rock or a jazz sensibility unless you've been there, unless you've listened, unless you've yeah. copped it. And like on my record, I got rock, I got funk, I got blues, you know, I got R&B, you know, I got, you know, ballad. I, you know, in New Orleans, we did a great version of Pocky Way. So, but all of those things are part of my listening wheelhouse you know not just yeah. the beatles but i mentioned yes who's my my next i guess favorite you know group totally. of, growing up listening to um the police you know all of that stuff absolutely like stewart's grooves and and like all of that is like part of my dna listening and i think in drum history you know we don't go back far enough i mean i tell like like whenever i do a master class whatever that, you know, was the last thing you listened to? Like, oh, whatever was on YouTube, you know. <laughs> and it's like, can you go back before 2000, maybe, yeah. you know, 1980 even? Or, 
if you mention the sixties or the seventies <laughs> music, you're like, what? You know, it's yeah. old man music, but then you play them some stuff and say, but do you see that this, you know, is where, who influenced these other people, you know, go, go back to the source as close as you can, as much totally. as you can, you know? Yeah. Now you have a very uh, like there are you, there are people such as yourself. I almost think of like Dom Famularo, where there's these these guys who are like I would I would deem you you know looking from the outside of I don't know what label you want to put on yourself, but almost as an independent drummer, like an independent artist. You play in your own band. You've played with other people. You do dr stuff with Drumio. You do all kinds of stuff like that. Drummers Collective, Musicians Institute. Um, is there any advice you would give to? drummers who are coming up in the educational, they're, they're, they're studying, they're working hard, to go that route of being a clinician, of, of making a career out of it, or did it just kind of happen? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, first of all, um, I just play music. Mm -hmm. The only label I want to put on myself is, while I have my influences, I've played my first, I guess, big gig was with Patti LaBelle. Um, and, but before that, I've d I did tons of Broadway stuff, a chorus line. I subbed a lot of shows. Hmm. So I, I did my sort of Broadway thing. Yeah. Um, but I was prepared because I went, to, I went to school for music. I got my bachelor's and master's in music, performance and education. Because education, I always was fascinated about, you know, the instrument and history. So teaching is, is sort of, you have to have a personality, I think, for teaching too, and like yes. wanting to give back. Um, so I just wanted to do that. I've always done it in my neighborhood. I would give kids lessons on snare drum. You know, we'd go over to my house and kid asked me to play something and I'd show them. But I just play music, you know, and whether it's doing that or Gloria Gaynor's gig or, or playing with Kaylee Minucci or Osnoy or, and, you know, even going back and doing a Broadway thing or my own band, or I did tons of club date work. I mean, I've, you know, I've done live TV, like mm. house band stuff, stuff on Comedy cool. Central. I was in a house band for a show called Exit 57. We did mm. like two seasons being in a house band. Wow. That was a lot of fun. So <laughs> it's like whoever wants to you hire me to play, I do. Totally. Then I also educate and teach but um and then i design products as well some by accident some on purpose we'll talk know, about that like a little bit tell us about Pro the products yeah uh well i designed the p4 practice pad um which initially was with zildjian on a distribution deal then i had it made here in the united states and uh, now drumio is distributing it hmm. And uh, it's a it's a multi level practice pad with four surfaces and three levels. Looks something like sure. this. Yeah, you there can you go. see the different levels. Yep. And you kind of move up. It's kind of like moving around the drum set a little bit, and it's got different surfaces. Uh, softer, harder. This is more like a cymbal, you know. So, and that came as an invention from teaching. I layered two practice pads on top of each other. Then I just started getting my mind going and. You know, you have to be entrepreneurial, I think, in part of in being in the industry. You asked about that. Yeah. that. That's a big part of it as well. So I'm not a clinician. You know, I've got people, I'm just a musician. I'm a drummer. Yeah, yeah. I'm a musician who plays and teaches and makes a living, designs products. I'm just in the industry. And I think that's part of it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I haven't hooked up with a big band to be the main drummer for. Yeah. You know, but I've done side gigs with major artists, and I think a lot of drummers are like that. You know, I think you uh, are absolutely but, right. I think, uh, I, and I will say, just so I don't forget, you mentioned the Broadway thing, and I very recently, uh, I want to give him a, a mention. I got invited to go to the Moulin Rouge uh, drum, you know, to the drummer Mark Party, P A R D Y, extremely mm -hmm. nice guy, long, long time uh, Broadway veteran, was in Cincinnati, invited me to go down in the drum booth. And man, you don't really realize until you're in there what's going on and how far you're kind of in the basement and you're in the this box and all that oh, yeah, stuff. The Broadway world they call it the is pitch interesting. For a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I, you know, crazy. Just, 
Yeah, just going back to my first show was the original A Chorus Line on Broadway. You know, I thought it would be this glamorous thing, and I go down in my first experience in the pit as soon as I walked in a room and seen these mice running across, <laughs> eating all the popcorn and the junk that's been left on the floor by the band, and I'm like, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, I got it. Different. So yeah. anyway, but um, yeah, so there's the P4 pad. I also designed the organic ride. Uh, the Zildjian K Custom Organic Ride. Cool. That's been out a long time now, about eight, nine years. Um, and I worked with Paul Francis on it. And um, it was just, a, I wanted to hear a different sound um, and a ride symbol that had a great bell, something you can crash on, but you can come back to the great uh, stick articulation mm. and um, something that was uh, very earthy but uh, and looked great. So it's an unlathe symbol. Um, mm, so the yeah. K Custom Organic Ride I Design is one of their top selling ride symbols. And it's available everywhere. And also it's part of the Sweetwater Studio symbol package. So if you oh, cool. go to Zildjian Studio Package in Sweetwater and you want to get a package of symbols, it's part of that. So, you know, it's it's always something. It has to be, you know. And yeah. um so I'm working on the next record um, already and talking to a couple different labels now, which is labels are still a thing, you know, yep. in certain genres. And um, and they can help. You know, it's not always a bad thing, you know, especially if they have, you know, a little bit of a budget to help, you know, make things work. So um, sure. to working on that. And, of course, we'll be the band will be gigging probably by the end of the summer and into the fall. Um, mostly around this tri-state area, but probably a, more in New York, the cutting room, a couple other places. Yep. But, but yeah, I mean, it's being in people, any advice I want to give is just, um, it's so different now. I mean, when making videos was like a thing that only Hudson Music did. And so totally. <laughs> I was one of the first to put an instructional video out with Hudson Music and I thank Robin, Bob Wallace, and the guys over there from the shout out to Hudson Music. These days, yep. everybody can do anybody does the video on their own phone. It's 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 so great, you know. Um, but how do you monetize that? I mean, like I knew that if I did an instruction in the video, I was going to be making some money eventually, you know, because yeah. that's yeah. what you do. These days, you make an you make a quote unquote video and put it out there. Are you are you really going to make money? Is two hundred what not. gets you money? Two hundred thousand views? Yeah, three hundred. Well, four, what, I mean, I mean, how do you? To be honest, that whole that whole side of things of and I just to speak on that from my YouTube experiences, you put out something that you put all this time in on. It doesn't even really matter unless you're at that thousand subscribers and whatever the limits you need to be at to get monetized. If you get you can sure. you can get it after the fact, but that first initial you know big big amount of views wouldn't even count, and you wouldn't get paid for it. Which, but right. should you still do it? Yes, because you know you that's how you get notoriety. But it's it's definitely a different world. It's that's funny. for sure. It's it's absolutely Bart, and it's funny because notoriety is not the you know it's one of those things where I think people are getting into the industry for it. I never got into it for notoriety. I yeah. only pursued it because this is what I can do the best yeah that's what i'm the best at and what i studied and what i worked at and what i trained at and and how i got my information was a lot different than how the people get information now and if i do have and that's crediting drum history where it it's due if i do have a pet peeve i probably have a few those of you who know me <laughs> pretty well if i have a pet peeve it is those who do videos almost pretending as if they've invented this fill or this sure. lick or this beat without cre crediting sources, which I know for a fact, I've seen a few that are licks right out of my book. Hands, grooves, and fills on Hudson Music, by the way. Yep, Orchestrations yep. or things from other people's books that I know are from other books or I know that I've seen other drummers play and they don't credit them. People, you're not the first, you won't be the last. So it would behoove you to source your drum history, where you learn things from. And because there's a lot of us out here who know. So that doesn't really put you in a great light. No. You know, here's this no. great lick. Well, 
okay, you didn't invent that. I mean, that's been out for a minute. So that's fine for those who may not have seen it before. But at the same time, it doesn't do our industry any good. That's why I'm all about like this How It Was Played series on Instagram. I want to do it for Ringo. I want to do it for Claude at Jabble. I want to do it for, you know, if I, I could do a Rush thing. I could do, I, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next, but I want to show what was played and I want to shine a spotlight on those people that we've long, all learned from. And, yep. you know, anything, I mean, are there, are there certain fills or licks that I've kind of developed that I've heard Steve Gadd do and turn around? Yes. And do I say that's sure. what the inspiration is? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, some people don't think that's important, and that's fine. I, I get that, but um, I'm kind of not like that. I'm right there with you. I, I think that even if I'm doing a video that's that's about the history of something, and I'm I'm taking pictures from somewhere else, it's it's different but similar. Where I always try and put the person's name or where I got the photo, or this per all these photos sure. were provided by the guest because it really. It's not fun to be listening or watching something and going, that's my picture. And there's no, and they just took it. But it's very, it is fun like and it does feel good to get credit in the bottom corner. And it's the same with playing. Yeah, it's a respect factor, Bart, I think really, isn't yeah. it? It's sort of a respect factor. You know, and I, I have to say, I've, I've been tagged on a few things on Instagram that are, gr you know, that, you know, all from all over, from Brazil, from different places, uh, I have to hit the translate button because I don't know exactly what they're saying. Yes. Tab, but they're playing my exercise and they're saying, I learned this exercise, you know, at Pat P. Drummer and da 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 da. da. And I think that's so cool. That's awesome. I appreciate totally. it. I mean, it's not about like, okay, I'm going to sell another book. I mean, it's really, really not about that. It's yep. really about saying, hey, man, thank you. It's that simple. That's what I'm saying to Ringo. Yeah. Ringo, thank you. Clyde. Man, absolutely yeah and and on the the flip side of it from from being at the chicago drum show that i just got back from which i will very briefly just say it was incredible it was the drummers hang it was the the great family reunion it was amazing to mm -hmm. see everyone but i will say that it was it was like you know we go out to dinner afterwards and and you talk to three people our community is so small that you kind of always have not that you're that i would say anything bad about anyone but mm -hmm. you kind of have to remember that like what you say in those three, with our community, what you say in those three people groups can very quickly mm -hmm. spread to the mm -hmm. entire community because we We're all talk to each man. other. We are tight knit. And if, if you're doing something kind of negative that you shouldn't be doing, that really spreads fast. So does good things. So we always say, oh, this person's doing great. This guy's such a nice guy. This girl's great. But if you do something sh shifty that you shouldn't be doing, it spreads fast or that person steals. Yeah, bad licks. news spreads quicker than good news. <laughs> really does. Bad yeah. news spreads a lot quicker than good news because yeah. it's 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 juicy and people want to know it bad news. They don't want to yeah. know good news. But we have a very yeah. tight industry as big as it is. It's very. So I guess another tip for people is, you know, another pet peeve of mine and John DeChristopher, if you're watching, you'll dig this too who is the former rep artist oh, yeah. rep for Zildjian. If you are so fortunate to be asked by a company to endorse their product, which is not an end all the be all, I've got newsflash for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It'll do more for them than it will for you. It doesn't put any yep. money in your pocket necessarily, unless you design a symbol, that's another topic. But they don't endorse you. I'm endorsed by blah, blah, blah. I'm endorsed by. It doesn't work that way. You endorse the company. You say, I proudly endorse X symbols. I proudly endorse this. I proudly endorse. Not they endorse me. I'm endorsed by Zildjian. No, they don't sure. endorse you. They're not an advocate You endorse for you. them. Yeah. You endorse the company because your reputation and your name reflects on the company and helps them to, to elevate their product line. So it's very self-serving to look at things that way. You're not, mm. they don't endorse you. You're lending your endorsement, your credibility, and your experience, whatever it may be, or your talent to their brand. That's yeah. status alone. Guys that I looked up to all those years when I, they say, I, man, I endorse and I play this and endorse this brand because I believe in it and I love the way it sounds. 
That's not, hey, man, I, I'm endorsed by Zildjian or I'm endorsed by this guy or endorsed by that. I understand yeah. it's a two-way street, obviously, but that's not how it yeah. goes. You endorse the company. Yeah. That's another I mean, it's different. You guys. If you're the top 1% drummers in the world and they're selling symbols by, you know, people buying posters that they see or, you know, Bonzo playing and it looks you see Peisty on the bottom and then people buy Peisty's. That's literally like the top one or two percent. But uh, endorsements, there's there's been an, a couple episodes on it. It's an interesting thing. I, I understand the, the 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 drive for people to be so I was like it when I was younger, where it's like I, I need to get an endorsement. I need to get an endorsement. It doesn't mean as much as people want. And I think there's a slippery slope of you get an artist discount, which is 20% off there's You're still buying this stuff. It's, it's a, it's a whole different. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's different, every company has their own model, but th there's you know, tiers, yeah. there are levels. Yeah. Absolutely. There are levels. And listen, it's, it's another way for them to sell symbols for sure. Uh, to a large, you know, another percentage of, of, of people. But, um, Listen, it's just it's just again, it's a way of how you present yourself to the drum industry. Yeah. If you're shouting I'm endorsed by I'm endorsed by I'm endorsed by people just going to turn you off, man, you know? Yeah. That's not that's not what an endorsement an endorsement is your endorsement of of their product, not the company does not endorse you. No. And you know, no, truth but, be told, yeah. if a company was to say that they endorsed you as a drummer or as a human being, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of drummers out there <laughs> with a little bit questionable, you know, things that they do on social media or whenever it may be. It's not always sure. the greatest thing. I mean, we've, we've seen some of that out there the past yeah. few years. But anyway, that's just another little pet peeve. But no, giving I, credit where credit is yeah. due is so important. I think both of those, the endorsements and the credit and all that, it all, that all does wrap in nicely to what we said about how to be a successful kind of independent working drummer going from gigs doing your own albums it's all just your personality yeah. and it's all it all just plays into that um yeah and it's and it is and it's not networking really it's it's relationship building and being and having a camp and a team of people like i have uh a team of, of a few people that that are helping with everything that i do and it's an important aspect, I and mean, you really can't do everything yourself. Although I recently have been, you know, I, I'm pretty hands on, but I sometimes you have to not, you know. It's it's yeah. Um, micromanaging is 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 sort of my pet my pet thing that I do as well. And um, sure, but if you want to get things done, you got to make sure you you're on top of it, you know. But business side communications, being able to speak to people professionally, and just be a just be a good person. I mean. Yeah, it's really, really important. You know, be the best person you can be. And I think, you know, you look at you had mentioned guys like you know Dom or anybody that's in the industry, Thomas Lang, who's who's great player and, and educator and quote unquote, whether they're educators or just great drummers, they're they're yeah, excellent yeah. people. You know, and I think Peter Erskine was one of his mentor of mine. Steve Gadd couldn't be more sweet. I mean, so those are you know people that you know I look up to and, and admire and and anybody you know who's in the industry you know even my contemporaries people like you know Aaron Spears and who just signed on with Ludwig which is great and yeah, I mean yeah. I've worked with Questlove on on his uh, pocket kit you know cool Amir is a, he's a sweetheart of a person uh, I did some of the instructional beats for for his uh, for his pocket kit the the kids drum set but yeah those you are know, awesome just really, really good, good people. You know, Mark Giuliana, great person. You know, great, great drummer. Um, Keith Carlock, another great person, great drummer. You'll, you'll see that. You know, there's good people, man. You know, and that's what you want to work with. And don't just network with other drummers. You got to meet bass players, guitar players, keyboard players, music directors. Those are the people that are going to want to use you on a gig. Yeah. I mean, that's how I got Patty Labelle's gig was playing in a fusion group in Philly with Ed Hamilton and Jose Rossi who used who was in Patty's band he was in Weather Report and he was in Patty's band for a long time and he preferred me to audition so that's how things happen you know so that's a really yeah. important yeah absolutely there is one other record that I did I don't mean to interrupt yeah, but I wanted to get it. it in and that's the Abbey Road Sessions record sure that I did at Abbey Road so you're talking about history uh, so um, that was our first record that, that we did uh, in Studio 2. 
And it was great horn band arrangements of Beatles classics. And it's on mm. my site. You can get the CD only at patpdrummer.com. And uh, we got great drum sounds. We used a couple of the same mics that, you know, Ringo used on his kit. Uh, I used, a, you know, a vintage Ludwig drum set. Uh, and uh, Paul Francis picked out some great Avidus cymbals for me to use. 15-inch hats, 14-inch hats. Um, cool. And that was a lot of fun. Just being, yeah, man, just being in that in that room. <laughs> Um, and, and, and listen, there's guys in the UK that are in that room once, twice a week. I get it. Yeah. You know, but for, for a kid from Jersey, it was a big deal, you know? So, That's a huge deal. Totally. It was a, it's a, yeah. it was a fun record and it's, it's out there. You can get it on my site. I might be re-releasing it on iTunes and all that in the coming uh, year as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for everyone, as we kind of wrap up here, patpdrummer.com. Under shop, you see all the the albums. There's T-shirts. There's the uh, Power Station Sessions album. But there's also a uh, drumless tracks, which is really cool. Which I think we all appreciate being able to play to that. Yes. Um, Pat P That's Drummer cool. on social media. Man, I appreciate you being here very much. And I just want to um, again say to before we end, I want to say to everyone I saw at the Chicago Drum Show, I had an absolute blast with you guys. It was incredible to be back. Um, it is it is just there's too many people to name, but it was very cool. And to hear some people said they listened to uh, the podcast, the entire drive from, let's say, Jersey to Chicago, which is about 14 hours or something. They listened to every incredible listen episode. So I'm, I'm I great. thank everyone for doing that. Um, That's great. And Pat. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we could finally get connected. And this is just a nice, tight episode. The episodes have been going on for like two hours recently. So I'm very <laughs> happy to have a nice short one of an hour and, uh, well, man, and to have you Bart, on, I my thank friend. Thank you for having me on. Really, I, totally. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you so very much and talking about everything. And and um, I'm a big fan of, of when you post stuff and, and, and learning about, you know, instrument history of drums or performance history of drums. And it's just great. It's just a, it's a phenomenal uh, thing that you've put together and many congratulations and continued success. Thank you, Pat. And keep on doing what you're doing and keep us updated with what comes out in the future. And uh, we'll have you back on, but uh, for now, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks everybody.